everyone. Welcome back to another episode of DadCast. I am JP. That guy over there is Nick. Nick, hello, sir. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. It's. Uh, I feel like it's been forever. I, uh, I've i been on vacation multiple times in the past couple of weeks. I'm going back on vacation again, which will be a great topic to discuss with today's guests. I'm going to love that. Um, and it feels like we haven't actually sat down and recorded an episode of DadCast in forever, even though we have. Yeah, I know. It feels like it's been about a month. Hey, but it hasn't. It's only been a couple of weeks, but crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy. Yeah. Um, before we get any further and introduce today's amazing guest, I want to thank you um, to our sponsors, uh, Great Notion Brewing out of Portland, Oregon. Nick is on it. Uh, some of the best beers in the world, period. Hands down, incredible variety. And if you're looking to get your self-delivered cold beer to your door, uh, just download the Great Notion app and uh, put in DadCast10 for yourself and get yourself an amazing discount on some amazing craft beer. So good. Today on the show, man, we have... Uh, this guy's got such a great story. I, I did a little deep dive on him before he, before he came on. Um, he... Back in the early 2000s, decided to take his son. I don't want to tell the story. I'm just going to introduce you, and you're going to tell us the story. Welcome to DadCast, Mr. Jeff Siegel. Hello, sir. How are you? Hey, JP. Hey, Nick. Great to be with you guys today. Yes, yeah, sir. So I kind of gave it away. Uh, the very first question, it's kind of a rite of passage here on DadCast. We always ask. Um, we know the answer, but we're going to ask it anyway. Are you a dad? Oh, yeah. Big I time. Big time. That's what we like to see. I, I just put up my, uh, see that right there? My kids made that for me for Father's Day about four years ago. They taped dad and then put their handprints, all three of my children, all over in different colors and then took the tape off and there it is. But uh, how many kids do you have? I have one. One. So, and uh, it is a son. It is a son. All right. So tell us, you know, in in, in depth, quickly, however you feel like, uh, a little bit about uh, how you came to be famous ish sort of with your whole relation trips. Yeah. Emphasis on the ish, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, you're on dad cast now, man. You're in the That's big true. time. I made the big time. Uh, actually JP, uh, it wasn't relation trips when it first came into being as it were, you were talking about, as you pointed out right around the year 2000, and uh, my marriage of many years was uh, coming to a close. And uh, I was very close to my son, who was about six at the time, and was very focused on how to maintain that bond uh, going forward, knowing that we were going to have two residences and things were going to change for him. Uh, so I was looking for ways in which to given how tight Spence and I had become in the short span of six years to make sure that that bond, forget about being adversely impacted, but continued to grow and thrive and prosper. Right. And sure enough, it had only been a couple of months. Uh, it was December of 1999, and Spence and I were watching the Chicago Bulls uh, play the uh, Houston Astro, the Houston uh, Rockets and a big, big sports fan at the time. He was when he was four years old, he used to wake up and regale me with the scores from the West Coast the night before because he'd have turned on the TV and was looking at the ESPN ticker. So anyway, we're watching this Bulls game and I guess geography in first grade was good enough that he looked at me when they put up the next couple of games on the Bulls road trip, which were going to be in San Antonio and uh, Dallas. And he said, Dad, uh, those are in Texas, too. And I said, yeah, you're absolutely right, Spence. And in fact, in the NBA, when a team goes to play all three Texas teams, they call it the Texas swing. And he looked at me and his eyes lit up, mm. big bulging brown eyes. And he said, Dad, I got an idea. How about someday we do our own Texas swing? And it's like, Eureka, great idea. So we started planning. We started planning this trip. And uh, I remember when I revealed to him we were having brunch on a Sunday and we had just started playing hangman and the answer to one of the puzzles ended up being the Texas swing. And he looked at me and he said, so, so, so what do we know now about the Texas swing? I said, we're going to do it. And he just lit up. And sure enough, about a month later over the holidays, uh, we headed down to Texas and we hit all three arenas, all three games. And uh, it wasn't but uh, about six months later, we were on another trip over spring break. And uh, we were catching some spring training games down in Florida. And he said, I have an idea, another idea. How about if between now and when I leave for college, 
we go and visit every NBA arena and every major league stadium. It's like, okay, I'm in. I'm in too. Let's go. Let's recreate this thing. Yeah, let's Let's do it. it. (laughs) And sure enough, guys, over the ensuing 11 years, 11, 12 years, uh, we indeed visited all 60 sites. We traveled tens of thousands of miles on the road. And out of that initial idea was born what ultimately would evolve into what I, as a marketing person, because that's kind of what I do in the my day job, uh, branded as relation trips. It was that simple. And you wrote a book about it, which is available on Amazon. Amazon and through my website, right. uh, myrelationtrips.com. Um, yeah, and, and it just sort of grew, guys, from the very start. That first Texas swing was really a very basic version of how we would build on it through the years creatively, whereby every trip would have a name and a theme and we'd do graphics and put them on T-shirts and notepads and luggage tags and we'd make up custom games and we'd have all sorts of uh, very customized elements to turn the common road trip into something much, much more, which, as you guys now know, we call the relation trip. Amazing. Now, this started as uh, fans of the Bulls. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, Chicago, born and bred for Spence. I've been here over 40 years, but the Bulls and the White Sox were from when Spence was, as I said, old enough to start being addicted to sports. Uh, spoiler alert. He's now 29 and has made his living in sports for the last decade plus sports broadcasting. Um, but oh. nonetheless, yeah, it was the Bulls that. Uh, He's a sports it. broadcaster now. Who is he uh, working for? Yeah, so he spent uh, about six years in baseball's minor leagues with a number of different teams. And then as a sideline a couple of years ago, started calling uh, soccer, one of his real loves for the United Soccer League. Oh. And then about a year or so ago, uh, was offered a spectacular opportunity to call uh, La Liga Soccer, uh, which if you guys are soccer fans, you would know is the second most prestigious soccer league on the planet behind the Premier League. And so he moved to Spain almost a year ago and he uh, calls uh, European La Liga Soccer and uh, futsal and uh, Euro League basketball and is loving it. So not surprisingly, at least not, thank you, at least not to me, um, those years and years that we spent on the road really helped cultivate his uh, interests, his love of what he chose to ultimately pursue as a career. And that's one of the many, many, I believe, side benefits of the whole relation trips approach is that it enables us to expose our kids to and encourage them to explore those interests, those things that really excite them and give us the opportunity as their dads to partner with them in that exploration. Now, Spence is 29 years old. Does he have any children of his own yet? He does not. Okay. So grandpa is, you've still dodged that bullet so far. (laughs) So far. (laughs) However, I thought you were going toward, has he carried on the relation trips uh, approach? And interestingly, he has a sister, not my child, but his, um, my ex-wife right. adopted a little girl many years ago, um, who's now uh, a freshman in college. And uh, as Olivia, his sister, uh, came of age, uh, he, in the last few years, including during the pandemic, took her on a relation trip. Um, and the two of them headed out west and visited all sorts of cool uh, hiking trails out in Colorado and Montana. Uh, so, you know, this is very much ingrained in him. It, That's it, amazing. How, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to see it continue on. Now, in 20 years ago, uh, uh, the, the ticket cost for an NBA game or an MLB game was considerably uh, more affordable. Um, today, that might be a little difficult for, uh, well, you know, did, you didn't just hit a bunch of games at once. Like you said, this was over the course of many, many, many years. Okay. Right. Then, then it's absolutely workable. For any of you guys out there, I, I think this is the greatest idea in the history of ideas. Um, and I would like to do that with my son. I have, I have three, three children. I have an almost 18-year-old daughter. And uh, my son will be 12 next month. And my baby girl is nine, just turned nine years old. 
the problem I have is if I say, all right, son, we're going to go, you know, do the Texas swing. And my little girl's like, but what about me? What's your advice yep. on multiple kids? Do we, do we do separate trips? Do we bring them together? Because let me tell you, those two together is chaos and fury. And uh, it's difficult sometimes. Trust me, I just got back from a trip with both of them. Okay. Well, I get asked that all the time. And uh, for Spence and me, sports geeks, as we were at the time and continue to be to this day, it was clear that the focus of our relationship was going to be ballparks and arenas and whatnot. But over the years, as I've talked to many different parents groups, and they've gotten back to me and shared with me what the focus of their relationships is, it literally, guys, runs the gamut. Um, and it can be, and I just jotted down for you guys some of my favorites here, um, amusement parks, national parks, uh, zoos and aquariums, county fairs, food specialties. I had some parents who got back to me and talked about how they decided within a three or four state driving radius to visit the best ice cream parlors. Another group went and checked out taco bars. Then there were, these are really cool, so I'll just rattle off a couple of them. There was a family that did a ghost hunt series of relation trips where they visited cemeteries and haunted houses. How about this for an idea? A book club where the family chose one of their favorite books and they visited the locations um, that were featured in that book. A random acts of kindness tour was what one family shared with me afterwards, where they visited different volunteer related locations across several states. So really, it isn't about the focus, so to speak. It's about the activity, doing it together. Right. And we haven't touched on yet. I'm sure we will, that there are stages to a relationship and the planning stages are every bit as important as the actual trip itself and then the post-trip documentation. But to finish answering your question, JP, runs the gamut. What excites the kids? What excites the family? And I've had families share with me that they divided up a seven or 10 or 14 day trip amongst a couple of kids where there was a loosely fit theme. And then each of the kids was kind of charged or assigned with coming up with how those few days were going to play out. Nobody's grading these relationships. It's not like, oh my gosh, if it doesn't conform to the overarching theme, it doesn't qualify as right. a relationship. This is about doing something fun together as a dad, uh, as a family. And, you know, there's plenty of leeway in terms of how you create that focus. That's amazing. So before even speaking with you, um, I've already set the foundation uh, for relation trips. Let me tell you, um, I mentioned right before we got on that um, I'm heading out this weekend with a trip with my son. Now, let me back it up. Last summer, we took him to Las Vegas to see SummerSlam, WWE. He, since his little guy, he's been a big fan of wrestling. And, and <clears throat> come on, dad grew up with Hulk Hogan. So, you know, I have no problem going to check out some wrestling. And if I uh, do this little bit, you can see right above there, there's, there's the belts. You know, yep. so replica belts. Th those are actual titles. Those are the nice. same ones. I got another one in the mail too, which will will you'll understand here shortly. So we took him to SummerSlam in Las Vegas, his first pay per view event um, last year. Uh, two years prior to that, we took him to his actual first event here in Oregon. Um, just a small little thing, uh, still WWE. But this weekend, we are now two summers in a row going back to Vegas for his second pay-per-view, Money in the Bank, WWE event. Yeah. Um, and it, we ingrained it in him last year. He had such a good time. It was, we, I mean, it's kind of, so did I. It was just absolutely amazing. And about a month or two ago, it was, Dad, 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 it's that time. It, 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 is there a pay-per-view in Vegas? And, and looked it up. Sure enough, Money in the Bank, bought the tickets, got the rooms, uh, ordered myself another $300 belt because we both need one over our shoulders when we go <laughs> – into the event and we are flying in this weekend to check out our uh, money in the bank man and nice. yeah i'm excited uh, but i really want to do not only that i mean every year now that's just it we have to go to a you know as long as he will let me take him to a wrestling event um i hope i get to 18 with that um we'll we will do that you know god willing but i also want to do a football tour uh, i'm a raider fan he's now a raider fan and i want to hit one season if, if i mean we'd have to take a lot of time off and have the money but try to hit every single game at every stadium in that particular season um that to me is the uh, ultimate relationship when it comes to me and my son 
Um, yeah, that's cool. Oh, but that's a lot of money too. So, yeah. all right, <laughs> logistics. Yeah, but you're hey, you're a marketing guy. Let's talk after we're off this show. Let's let's see what we can get going on here, right, Nick? I remember how cool it was. Like when I was a kid, I'd go down to San Francisco to visit my grandparents, and my grandpa took me to Giants games every year. We got to see Frank Thomas's rookie season. Awesome. Like that guy is so big. Like, it was just incredible. That's something I'll never forget. So it's like, I try to do that with my kids. Like we figure out different things. The baby right now loves the zoo. So we just took him to the Portland zoo and had planning a San Francisco zoo trip pretty soon. So yeah, they're, yeah. it's, 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 they're amazing. These trips are amazing. Yeah. And again, they're frustrating. Um, you're <laughs> lucky because you have the single son. Right. Um, you know, the, the dynamic with me was, you know, they're so close in age and of course cramped in the car for so long. I mean, for our trip, it was a 14 hour drive, um, chaos. And, uh, when they're separate, it's just, I don't know, it, it seems to work better. You know, you get more of that emotional, mo those moments that mean more because you're not spending most of your time yelling at them to stop fighting each other in the back seat. So, I mean, the dynamic, like I mentioned earlier with both of them, I personally think it is it is depending upon the family and the children and, and everything involved. But for me, I would like to do, because it'd be more fun that way too, have three relationships, one with the son, one with the daughter, and one with both of them. Oh, and mom, yes, you can come along too. I'm just, <laughs> you know, throwing that out there. Yeah, there's no rules again. Yeah. And um, the car is an amazingly... Uh, conducive environment uh, for conversation. I like to say that uh, uncomfortable silences tend to break up right around the 100 mile mark. Uh, and that environment uh, encourages the kind of discussions that run the gamut from, you know, silly and whimsical to serious and life altering. And over the years, uh, it evolved as Spence got older. Uh, and, and I can tell you guys, we had some of our best conversations uh, as we drove from uh, Seattle to Portland, for example, uh, which was one of our relationships. We spent New Year's Eve in Portland one year, which carries with it some fun stories maybe we can get into. But um, yeah, I mean, whether it's one on one, one on two, the whole family, again, no rules. And it's what works best for you guys, uh, given the circumstances. And by the way, I will tell you, we can carry this part of the conversation offline. We're AEW guys. <laughs> and if Nick doesn't look like a young Rick Steiner, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm come on. Right. right. I know. Freaking, oh, dog. Okay. He I is. Mean, he does. Wow. He does. Hey, hey I, so I was in Vegas. I go to Vegas a lot, Jeff. Um, so I was there last week with the family and three weeks or two weeks before that. So not even a month ago, um, I was there for a, a buddy of mine. He wanted to go and I says, okay, let's go to Vegas. I got some, I got some comp rooms. Let's do this. Look up what was going on in town and AEW was in Vegas right. for the pay-per-view. Oh, and wow. then, and uh, I think a dynamite and something else. So I'm like, okay, it's Wednesday night. When I, it was Wednesday morning. I woke up, <coughs> see how much tickets were. And I scored me a pair of tickets for less than a hundred bucks each third row ringside. Nice. And uh, yeah, so that was before MGI Jeff walked out and, and punk was there uh, hyping up the whole uh, shot against hangman. But man, that I don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a wrestling fan since I was a kid and seeing another promotion, especially AEW and man, I wanted more than anything, a replica belt, and I was in line and some guy bought the last one, about five guys in front of me. And turns out that thing was 800 bucks anyway, so I wasn't going to buy it. But yeah, man, I'm a fan. I'm a fan well, of AEW. And yes, Rick Stein, yes, he just needs to friggin' get the wrestling. Did, did you, you wrestled, didn't you, Nick? Do you have a headset you could put on for the rest of the episode? I don't anymore. It's been, <laughs> it's been since high school, dude. Google Rick Steiner right now. Doing it right now. <laughs> so... Fun one-off story, and I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole because then you'll have to edit this stuff out. But Spence and I used to hit pay-per-views on some of these relationships because he was a big WWE fan okay. way back when. And we indeed hit 
SummerSlam one year when it was in the Sky Dome and we were in Toronto and we were staying in the same hotel in the Sky Dome with the WWE dudes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, among the many, many fun little anecdotes from that trip is we got back after the Blue Jays game. We walk into the hotel and off to the right in the bar sitting alone by himself is John Cena. Wow. So we've got some great pics of Spence with Cena. We ran into Edge in the elevator and Spence said, can I please take a photo with you, Mr. Edge? He goes, yeah, let's step out of the elevator. And we took a bunch of photos. The best part of all was there was a fire drill at three in the morning and everybody had to evacuate. And we're in the uh, in the elevator with Chris Jericho and Christy Hemi. And Jericho turns to Spence, who's all of like, I don't know, nine or ten at time and said you think this is pretty cool don't you so (laughs) it was just one of those really memorable weekends wow man so so this is the guy right yeah there it is i like i'm kind of stoked i'm I'm actually a little bit bigger than this guy (laughs) (laughs) okay you're not though he's about a foot taller than you okay i'll give him that give or take remind (laughs) remind me jp offline to tell you some additional fun wrestling related stories that date back to when I was uh, editor of one of the very first uh, wrestling newsletters. Wow. See, it, and I, I have, would have had no idea. So I bring that up and here we are. We could spend the rest of this hour right. talking this. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears from the wrestling here after I mention this, because you brought it up as well. We're also staying in the same hotel as the event. So it's at the MGM Grand. They moved it from Allegiant Stadium. Uh, they probably couldn't sell enough tickets. Right. Um, so they moved it to the MGM Grand Garden Arena. And my, my hotel's in there. So crossing our fingers that we get an elevator experience or we walk and see someone in the bar. Or they're sitting at the blackjack table. I can't take my son up, but, you know, there's only one one set of elevators at the MGM Grand. I don't know if you guys are aware yeah. of this. And there's a lot of them, but there's only one spot to go. They go all the way up, and then once you're at your floor, they split off to whichever direction your room is. So I think if we just kind of hang out right around there for a couple hours, you know, at any point in time, the odds are good we will run into a WWE superstar, get some pictures. Maybe they could sign the belt. I don't know. But... uh I've got I've got the replica. It's coming in the mail tomorrow. I okay. bought it for this event. The WB the dual the dual eagle winged belt, which debuted in '88, which Macho Man got at WrestleMania four for the first time, and went through ten years. So Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Diesel, all those guys carried that belt. I got my replica coming for tomorrow, and You're hey, ready to go. Hopefully, one of those guys, one of the guys who ever held it, if they sign it, oh. That's bucket yeah. list for me, but we're, can you tell dad's excited about this weekend? <laughs> I think I'm more excited than him. I'm glad he brought it up because obviously he had such a good time on the last trip. That is amazing. All right. Uh, is there any particular, like any particular, and I'd say baseball game that you and Spence went on during your relationships during this whole years and years journey that sticks out any one particular game? Well, uh, Often we get asked, what were our favorite ballparks? But this is a cool question. What games stick out? One of them that immediately came to mind is when we were in Boston at Fenway Park and Dante Bichette uh, hit a home run off of the giant uh, Coke bottle in uh, left field. It was just a moonshot. And uh, we referenced that uh, to this day, not only because it was such a gargantuan you know, homer, but uh, Spence spent a year in the Toronto Blue Jays organization. And as you may know, Dante Bichette Jr. Um, I don't know that he's Dante Bichette Jr. I can't remember his first name now off the top of my head. But he was drafted and was coming up through the organization. And uh, Spence started to feel for the first time, good grief, the kid of a guy who I saw hit the Coke bottle home run is now in professional baseball. Yeah. Well, that game sticks out. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, We went to the, this isn't really part of a relationship, but uh, we went to the first game of the World Series in 2005 when the White Sox, uh, our hometown team, were in the series. So that's one of our most memorable uh, baseball games that we've attended. And then I would also say we attended a ton of minor league games along the way. And while none of the games necessarily would stick out just some of the experiences because have you guys been to any minor league games we actually have a 
if there's a minor league for the minor leagues for the minor leagues, we have a team here in Medford called the Medford Rogues. They, uh, there's a lot of college kids um, yeah. who, uh, you know, when it's not when a college ball is not in season, um, they're actually playing right now. Well, not right now, but in this right. time period, sure. um, called the Medford Rogues. I think it's a division who something I, I don't know but it's it's definitely a minor league what nick the Portland Timbers are a minor league team right yeah 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 uh, i don't know the tour is still around they used to yeah. be owned by uh, i think bill murray had a piece of it and yeah. the guy who played squiggy and uh laverne and shirley owned a piece of it speaking of I'm bill murray <laughs> what's that so speaking of bill murray oh yeah there you go <laughs> nice um but yes we have and it's it's i love it yeah, it's a whole different experience, and I'll tell you one quick story that sort of answers your question, what games do we remember? We attended um, a doubleheader in Modesto, California, the oh. home to the Modesto Nuts. That's the, the, the butthole of California, for the record, for anyone who doesn't know. I'm from California, so I know okay. the state through and through. Um, Modesto is not a fun place to be, unless, of course, you watch minor league baseball. No offense to anyone living in Modesto. I feel bad for saying that. You know, we spent a night there on our way up the coast from – we started – down in San Diego and two weeks later ended up in San Francisco, Oakland. And um, Modesto was a stop along the way for a double header. And uh, two things happened at that game that make it one that Spence and I continue to talk about to this day. One is he got his first foul ball. Nice. Pretty cool. And uh, one B is that he got the dude who hit the foul ball, a guy named Corey Wimberly, who went on to have, a career, he had a cup of coffee in the majors, but now he's coaching. Anyway, he autographed it after the game, but the <laughs> the biggest moment was when we were leaving the ballpark. There were these giant racks of white bread, packaged white bread. I mean, hundreds of packages of white bread. And the employees from the Nuts team were standing there saying, take all the bread you want. Take all the bread you want, which has become a catchphrase all these years later for Spence and me. Take all the bread you want. Whoever we're making sandwiches, one of us will look at the other and say, take all the bread you want. Yep. <laughs> so that was a game that sticks out for those reasons. And there you go. And that's what I was looking for. You know, the, it, it, I say this on so many of the episodes. Nick will know. He'll, he'll attest to it. It only takes a moment to make a moment. And that moment for you has now lasted the span of, what, 20 years? Oh, yeah. And we'll continue yeah. on for the rest of your relationship with your son. That it's amazing, man. And all of a minor league baseball game that happened randomly over some bread. That's that's and, what we're and, talking about, man. And there's dozens more like that. I, I referenced earlier, JP, about the documentation of the trips, how we would come home and create these scrapbooks and these videos and um, you know, when people ask you, what's the first thing you grab if your home was on fire? My answer without question is always these scrapbooks because they've got everything, stick, uh, ticket stubs and menus and um, pieces of candy that we got on the way into the arena and photos and programs. And it's just, I take them out. And as a matter of fact, during the pandemic, Spence and I, he was home for a few months and we would take out those scrapbooks two a day, all these years later and revisit them and tell stories and talk about, you know, what our favorite memories were from those trips. So we, you are making an investment in your kids. And this is sort of from the macro level um, that pays off so many times over. And the most, the, the biggest commodity, the biggest investment, I always say is the time. It doesn't matter how much you spend on tickets or hotels. These days you can find $5 tickets online for major league games. You can find, you know, cut rate hotels or Airbnbs. It's not about, you know, spending big bucks. It's about spending big amounts of time. And I'm here to tell you, it pays off. You may not realize it at the time, but when you step back and you have the perspective that I now do of a son who's going to turn 30 next year, uh, you realize, hey, the reason that we FaceTime now several times a day and he's 5,000 miles away and that we text constantly is because the groundwork, the foundation was laid and the bonds were built that now, all these years later, heck, I'm learning Spanish now <laughs> so that I can converse when I go yeah. over there in a few weeks. And he and I now text back and forth in Spanish. I'm not saying it's a direct 
you know, line between, oh, we went on all these cool trips together and now we bond over learning another language. But uh, you'd have a hard time convincing me that there isn't some correlation there. Yeah. So what is it, about 930 in Spain right now? Uh, it's seven hours ahead. It's 230 here. So it's 930 there. Can you FaceTime him right now? Uh, I could try. I don't know if I'll get him. Let's try. Just, I want it. I want, and then if you get him, tell him you're on a podcast called Dadcast, and then put that up to the camera. Okay. Spence has got to be a part of this episode in some form or fashion, if at least <laughs> talking about him more. We'll give it a shot. All right. I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh -huh. but... Maybe, you know, they eat dinner really late there. Mm. All right, we tried. Now we tried, and I will text him. Uh, no, <laughs> no biggie. I just, that, that would have been a perfect timing. We're talking about this, and, and oh, you know. Oh, oh, it's going back. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you there? <laughs> Oh, I think they're out. All right. I'm on a podcast right now. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Hold on. Should I go to a quiet place? Yeah, go to a quiet place. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> this is kind of, this was completely unplanned, right? Right. So I'm on a podcast now, the Dadcast podcast with JP and Nick, who looks just like Rick Steiner. And we were talking about, they're from Portland. And we were talking about Razor Clam, and I haven't yet gotten to the story about our New Year's Eve and the 50 uh, deviled eggs in Portland, well, along with Pizza Schmitza. But they just asked, can I get you on a, uh, how do you guys want me to do this now? I just, so, just turn it around so we can see him. There he is. Right. Oh, What's oh, up, Spence? Let me, uh, turn this around so that he can see you. Oh, ooh. There we go. I don't, I don't, we're, doing? it feels oh, like oh, we're, wow. we're in it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Inception right. episode. So there he is. There we go. Okay. Yes. Hello, Spence. Congrats on that career, man. We're hearing all about yeah. it, man. Love it. That's awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, splitting all image. Right. Uh, I, it's so funny to see this right here, this glimpse of you, dad and son, because online, it, Spence is like 11 years old, 10 years old in those yeah, pictures. Exactly. And now he has facial hair and almost 30. This is amazing. All right, thank you for coming on, man. I, yeah, man. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for putting up with our late night intrusion, but <laughs> back to your buds and we'll catch up later, okay? All right. All right. <laughs> Adios. See ya. <laughs> Okay, that that was, that was a first on Dadcast, and and thank you Jeff Siegel for being so cool about that. You know, again, uh, there's times where I ask people to do things, and I'm I don't think before that just comes out of my mouth. And uh, well, that one worked out real well. It did. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool. Nick, have you put together a fast five today? I did. All right, fast five, Jeff. This is a segment. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. Five fast questions from Nick Martin. Here we go. All right, if you could have a billboard, anything on it, what would it be and why? Ooh, I, how much time do I have to think about that? That's technically um, two questions now that I think about it, Nick, but okay. I know. Okay, uh, if I could have a billboard, what would it be? Great question. Um, I think it might be one of my favorite photos of Spence and me at uh, one of our games, actually a game we, photo we took at the 2015 World Series and it would say something like uh, um, enjoy the journey or uh, yeah, something like that. Enjoy the journey. Dig it. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, all time favorite NBA player. Oh, Michael Jordan. I knew the answer to that one for Yep. Okay. <laughs> Spencer be, would Spencer be the same? You think? Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. Have all you ever met Michael Jordan? Uh, no. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Met Mick Foley. Huh? Met Mick Foley. Have Man. a nice day. <laughs> All-time favorite MLB player. All-time favorite MLB player. I would probably say Tom Seaver because I spent the first 21 years of my life in a foreign country called New York, and I was a big Mets fan. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Okay. Your funniest parenting fail. Oh. My funniest 
parenting fail. I actually can't tell you the funniest one on the air, so we'll bookmark that. For, for the record, this this is not a, a restricted show, so I'm just throwing it out there. My son would kill me. Okay, uh, in that case, I understand. Yeah, so instead, I will say um, he was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old, and Spence started giving me this story about what he called the bird sanctuary that they had visited and he wanted me to hear all about the bird sanctuary and he went on and on and he strung it out for 15 20 minutes and i had bought in a million percent i was asking him questions as i was prone to do and the reality was it was april 1st and i didn't realize it and i uh, <laughs> failed miserably in being astute enough to understand that i had been duped and to this day when one of us tries to pull the wool over each other's eyes there's always a bird sanctuary reference <laughs> that's amazing Jeff Siegel, man, you're a great dad. Oh, I love having great dads on this show. That is, it's just, mm. I know there's more questions. I, I just, again, that's part of the mouth thing. Nick? I have one more. Okay. Your favorite meal to cook for your son? When you uh, did. Pasta. He was a big pasta dude. And interestingly, Nick, he's become the gourmet chef. And when we're together, he's whipping up all kinds of stuff. But when he was younger, it was always... Uh, whipping up pasta with different types of sauces. Although, although I alluded to it, here's a connect the dots thing, guys. When we were in Portland for yep. New Year's Eve, <laughs> and we, there was no game that night, and we went out, decided we were going to do a uh, New Year's Eve buffet in our hotel room while we watched the UFC's greatest knockouts, which was <laughs> on that night. Was, so Adam, did, was Josh Berkman on that episode, or was that too long ago? No, I that was too long ago. Okay. Too long ago. But we hit a place called Pizza Schmitza. I don't know if it's still there. We got oh, two yeah. of them around here. Okay. We did that. We got some tacos at some place that escapes me. And then we stopped by some uh, grocery store and they had uh, 50 deviled eggs, like actually 25 deviled eggs, 50 halves. For like nine ninety nine, and Spence said, "Let's get that." And I said, "Why not?" And we took fifty uh, deviled eggs to our hotel room. We didn't eat them all, and they didn't really do well in the refrigerator. So. <laughs> deviled eggs don't typically do. Yeah, it's like buying sushi at a gas station, man. Unless you make those things at home, I ugh, wouldn't recommend it. Exactly. Um, so Nick, that was his fast five. I like to add a few couple questions uh, along that the theme as well. Um, this is always my most serious question I ask on DadCast, so we can get a little bit lighthearted afterwards. And this can be lighthearted. It all depends on the answers. Am I building the question up big enough for you yet? Okay, here we go. What is one thing you, Jeff Siegel, could impart um, advice-wise to any new dad or about to be a new dad out there? That's the easiest question you could have asked. Enjoy every single freaking minute no second because you blink and they're 29 living overseas and living their dream but if you take the time as i'm very proud uh, and grateful to say that i did to milk every single opportunity to spend time bond hang out laugh cry um you look back and as i do you have no regrets whatsoever because it does go in a flash. And I am fortunate, like I said, and so, so grateful to uh, know that Spence and I have enjoyed and benefited and grown from every single moment together. All right. Here's a question. Maybe that just came to me as you were uh, telling that answer. Um, I, don't even, I don't even know if it's answerable. Uh, can you take us back pre-divorce? It never happened. Would the relationship journey still have happened if you did not become a single father? Would there be a different version of it? I think it would have been very different. Um, I'm not suggesting that, hey, get divorced. Yeah, 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 yeah. With your kids. <laughs> I, I'm saying you play the hand that you're dealt. And point of fact, um, I'm very also very proud of the fact that Spence's mom and I are still to this day, after a rough patch some 20 years ago, so we've been divorced over 20 years, uh, good friends. And uh, we have a text chain, uh, Spence and his mom and his sister and me, and we text amongst us all the time. So it, it would have been different. I don't know that the ability to have the kind of concentrated, focused time 
would have been there. Actually, it probably wouldn't have. But then again, as some one of my very close Zen friends like to say, um, it is what it is. And, you know, it wasn't that way. This is the way it was meant to be. Right. So it played out in a way that uh, benefited everybody. And Spence has dealt with adversity like all kids do. And this was just one, actually not even the most serious of the adversities he's dealt with. He's 29 years old and has had two bouts with cancer, which he doesn't like when I talk about. But the reality is he's my hero. Um, He beat it both times. He's clean, thank God. And, um, you know, he has, again, triumphed over the curveballs, pun intended, that he's been thrown. So, uh, yeah. Now, growing up, did you have custody? Was it split custody? It was very amicable. Okay. Uh, Spence chose to, uh, when he turned 13, to live with me during high school. But, uh, you know, his mom lived um, a short 10 minute drive right. to get that away. And, you know, that was back and forth. So we uh, made it such, we truly made him the priority. And then she had her little girl that she adopted. So that was another focus for her. But, you know, all good. So when it came to, you know, saying, hey, we're going to take a road trip cross country and check out eight baseball games over the next three weeks, it, it just planned. Everything was good. And oh, yeah, yeah. Well, our trips uh, were built initially around, uh, you know, spring break and uh, holiday break and summer break and so on. And then I was equally uh, accepting of what she wanted to do with her travels. And then by the time he was 14, 15 years old, I don't have to tell you guys, kids are going to tell their parents what they're doing. Oh uh, yeah. 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 It, they also know everything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> my 16 year old daughter thinks that, you know, we never had a life. My 17 year old daughter, gosh, yeah. almost 18. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's no possible way that we could have ever experienced anything close to what she's going through in the world you know we just just appeared and became their parents yes yeah exactly we didn't live life we didn't have any of those problems the only (laughs) tell you what chloe if you watch this i'm talking to you girl the only thing we didn't have back then was this (laughs) and the internet okay every other problem still the same so listen to me i promise i'll help you through it that's what i'm here for Oh, gosh. Sorry. That was a parenting moment in the middle of a podcast. All right. <laughs> okay. So favorite football team is, are you fans of football? Oh, yeah. Bear yeah, fan? Yeah, yeah. Chicago Bears. The Bears. Okay. I figured as much. My lady uh, is a big Bear fan as well, and and, and I, we still can't figure out why. She's never been to Chicago. She doesn't live there, obviously. Never been. So I'm like, why are you a Bear fan? She's like, well, I just really like Brian Urlacher. I'm like, okay, then there, there you go. That, that has nothing to do with it, yeah, I guess. But I'm slowly converting her to the dark side. There you go. It's good stuff. Um, have you done any uh, relation trips to football games? We have. We, um, by last count, uh, I think we've been to nine or ten NFL uh, stadiums. You know, while baseball and basketball were the focus, we were pretty darn flexible. And if we were out on the road, we would always strive to have one, what we would call surprise game where we would just figure it out on the fly. And it could be anything from, yeah, it could be anything from uh, lacrosse to uh, horse racing to you name it. We attended some wacky sporting events and um, again, no rules. We would build the trips around these sites that were part of this particular relationship trip. But if opportunities presented themselves and, you know, again, without getting too clinical, because when I wrote the book, I did a fair amount of research, spoke with a number of Chicago land um, child psychologists and realized that what Spence and I had stumbled into or onto, there was some clinical underpinning for a lot of this. And one of the things that the whole relationships approach, um, and one of the many things that was clinically supported in terms of child development was being able to adapt and to be flexible. You're out there on the road. Some days you're just taking it as it comes. You might hit a traffic jam. You might be going across as we were at the Southwest and there's tumbleweeds coming across the road that's where there's deer, uh, not deer, uh, what the heck was it? There was some group, maybe it was deer, 
or it wasn't moose, but they were crossing the highway and there was a backup for a good hour or so. So, you know, there are things that you get to experience out on the road that are unplanned for and that um, expose your kids again to things that they're going to need to know as they grow up. It's amazing. I want to just, all I want to do is relation trip now, but Again, I got one coming up in literally two days. Dude, you're going to two days. Who's your favorite wrestler of all time? Oh my gosh! Oh, I could go old school on you. Uh, uh, please do. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure you and I are bred from the same cloth, about the same age. If I were to guess, you graduate. I guarantee you, I, guarantee you I got you by a good 10, 15 years. Oh come on! Now I'm going to take that as a compliment, but I don't think so. I dye this beard. What year did you graduate high school? Well, I'll tell you, I was born in 59. Holy crap. I guess you do got me. You're looking great, Jeff Siegel. My God. Hang out with your son. 69. So exactly 15 years. You you were you exactly 74. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to be 63 in August. Huh. So Okay, so go old school on oh, me. So, yeah, I'll go real old school on you. Because remember, I grew up in um, New York on the East Coast when it was the WWWF. MSG, when, MSG, right, right? Where, you know, Vince McMahon Sr. was the dude in charge. Mm-hmm. And um, Bruno San Martino, man. That there was, you Yeah, dude, he was he was the Hulk Hogan of my era as right. a kid, you know. Right. And, right, it went Bruno and then Pedro and then Backlund and yep, then Hogan. Yep, so, oh, that, yeah. And you got to see him live probably multiple oh, times, yeah, huh? MSG, MSG. Only oh. though... Um, MSG back in the day, if you can believe it, if you were under 15 or 14 or 15, you couldn't, you weren't allowed to be there live at MSG. And if you were between like 15 and 18, only accompanied by a parent. So right. I, think I was like 15 years old before I went to see Bruno. Wow. But still, great. you got to see him, man. That's <laughs> amazing. My first ever wrestling. God, what was it? It, it? it was late. My first, I mean, I got all the pay per views. I mean, I was. A crazy 11 year old when Hogan slammed Andre at WrestleMania three, just freaking out. But the first actual live event, I think was at the old forum in LA and it was in the beginnings of the rock. So I guess at the early attitude era, the two thousands um, was my first live event back in LA, but man, that's amazing. Backland and MSG Nick. That's like, I don't know. That's like watching for you, Joe Montana in 1983 at the super bowl or something, <laughs> you know? Oh, I'm sorry. 83, the Raiders won the Super Bowl. Uh, I'll tell you who else has a special place in my heart. Uh, As I mentioned, I do for four plus decades, corporate events and big sales meetings and have produced a couple of pro wrestling shows as part of corporate events. Okay. And worked on a couple of them uh, with Jim Cornette, where we used uh, some of his boys from Smoky Mountain back in the day. Uh Uh-huh. Anyway, um, Cornette... And I have kept in touch through the years, took him to a Bulls game a few years ago, and I was just stunned at how many people, you know, come up to him and like, you're at a Bulls game and people recognize Jim Cornette. I mean, he's, you know, famous, but you wouldn't think. Anyway, the stories that he's shared, many of which, you know, again, are uh, not for public consumption, but you think that business is crazy, JP? You talk to a couple of people in it. And the stories that they share with you will make your ends stand on hair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. It's, uh, you know, Cornette's I, got that uh, the Starcast coming on July thirty first. Ric Flair's final match. Man, seventy three years old, and he's putting on another match, and they don't even know he's wrestling yet. Right. So, if you want to really connect some more dots, uh, we can. Uh, my personal opinion, please editorializing here, noted as such, I think Ric Flair is a stunning example of the worst possible kind of dad. And I have amongst oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On social media been very critical um, of his role or lack thereof as a dad. And uh, I'm not uh, I, I, I am not afraid to say that I think he played uh, an unfortunately uh, big role in the death of his son. Um read but yep. you know that's controversial and um since we're talking dads i think he's everything that a dad shouldn't be i 100 percent agree yeah you know i ain't gonna disagree with that only thing i can agree is as a wrestling fan and if you block out everything else rick flair yes if you block out everything else yeah. in the ring 
bell to bell and then some sure but you know uh, you know no he's um, yeah i, I yeah I, he's it, it, well, we're gonna stop talking about rick flair <laughs> the whole point was that Cornette is throwing out the sarcast and that's july 31st in nashville i was actually an hour before we got on the show i don't know how i stumbled upon it but I did probably when I was looking up my belt information, but that's besides the point. And I looked up all the meet and greets for that event. Cornette's there, Shivani, um, Brian, Daniel Bryan's going to be there for some reason. And my new favorite, I don't know if you keep up. Oh, you're an AEW guy. Of course you are. Friggin' Danhausen. I love that guy. I, I can't even explain why, but he's going to be there to sign on autographs and, I'm pretty bummed, Nick, because our event in Nashville does not coincide with the same dates. Otherwise, I would have stayed an extra couple of days. Hey, come here, little girl. You want to meet someone? You want to meet my new friend? Come here. Oh, this is my daughter. This is my littlest. This is Mr. Jeff Siegel. This is Avery. Avery. Hey, Avery. What are you? You're not shy. It's just a screen. Come on. Look at it. Say hi to Jeff. You know what he does? Or what he did and still does that we should do? Okay, what's your like most favorite thing in the world? Like if we were to go see something somewhere, what would it be? Don't take too long though. Come on. Like what do you mean by see? Like, I don't know, uh, Disney's, Disneyland or water parks or uh, baseball games or football games or basketball games or wrestling or something, parks. Places, what's your, like, if we could go somewhere right now, far away, anywhere, where would you want to go? Um, I would want to go. Speaking to the microphone. Why, um, Disney World. Disney World. Okay, so she wants to go to Disney World. How would you like to go to a Disney-type park once a year, every year until you're 18 with your daddy? Yeah, I agree. All right, good talk. I love you. I'll be done in a minute. Nice meeting you, Avery. <laughs> Jeff said, nice meeting you. She's waving off camera. There it is. You can see it. <laughs> got it. I got it. Not yet, baby. Okay. And she, yeah, she doesn't listen very well. Oh, I'm see. It's getting hot in here. I'm starting to glisten, you guys. It's heating up. But, um, okay, where were we? We weren't talking about that guy anymore. The rest of this shall not be named. Um, yeah, Starcast. Nashville. You guys have an event in Nashville. Yes, Dan Housen. I love that man. And there and there you have it. Okay. Right. Jeff Siegel. <laughs> man, it has Yo. been so much fun talking to you. Yeah. I have two final questions for you. Okay. And I'm only asking you these questions on the air to put you on the spot. You'll understand why. Um, okay. Question number one. I would like to formally invite you back to our annual Father's Day episode. However, you have the luxury of being our very first guest coming on after the Father's Day episode premiered. So in your case, we're talking almost a year away from recording the third annual Father's Day Dadcast yeah. special, and we would love to plant the seed and have you on that episode for next I'm year. In. Okay, Nick, put that in a special file and do what you do. It's there. Two. Two. We need to get, we need to get your son on, too. I'll we line can, it up. Let's do I it together. Do, I want to do a part two of this and talk more about the book and more about the adventures and with both of you. I think that would be amazing. Absolutely. He can zoom in from uh, overseas, yeah. you guys. I will ultimately share with you his uh, email address, and you can okay. reach out to him as well. Absolutely. And that was actually my second question, is can we have you on for a part two? Because I feel like sure. we did not even come close to yeah. the amount of stuff we could talk uh about i mean again i think you know we're gonna have you on two more times uh the next episode we're just talking wrestling the third time we're gonna talk everything <laughs> whatever you guys want i love doing this stuff and you guys are a blast and just say the word you know where to find me excellent he is mr jeff siegel author of relationships and apparently an incredibly awesome corporate marketer who uh maybe could uh you know <clears throat> Market Dadcast. I'm just saying, trying to drop it a seed right there. <laughs> to everyone watching and paying attention to Dadcast and listening and loving it, thank you so much. We appreciate all you do and all your support. Without you, uh, Dadcast wouldn't be a thing. So thank you very much. We will catch all of you on the very next episode. Have a great rest of your day. Once again, Mr. Jeff Siegel, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. See you guys see you. later. See ya.